Alongside these vast hordes of orcs, Sauron had plenty of men in his service too. These men are broken down into two broad groups, the Easterlings who came from the East and the Haradrim, also commonly known as the Southrons who came from the South. But there's more to these men than just serving Sauron. So in this video, we're going to take an in-depth look at the Easterlings and the Haradrim. Who were they, what were they like, and how were they perceived by the Free Peoples in the West? Unfortunately, like with many things, Tolkien never sat down and wrote long descriptions about the Easterlings and the Haradrim. They were antagonists from faraway lands, and few of the heroes of Tolkien's stories encountered them in any capacity other than battle. But they do appear enough in the stories and histories to give us a decent idea of what they were like, and the rather large differences between them. Yes, the Haradrim and Easterlings both served Sauron, but their civilizations were clearly quite different. Firstly, I do want to say that neither of these groups were monolithic in nature. Easterlings and Haradrim is a broad descriptive term for basically anyone that came from the East or the South. While there were obvious markers that gave away whether someone was from the East or South, it should come as no surprise that these lands were populated by many different peoples. Some of these are named, some of them aren't. Some of them are described in detail, others are merely footnotes. With the Easterlings, we know of a few distinct types of people. The Easterlings who troubled Gondor for the first half of the Third Age were not the same as the Wayne Rider Easterlings who appeared in the 19th century. In the 25th century, the Balkoff appeared. They were descendants of the Wayne Riders, but had changed enough over time to be considered a different group of people. Even at the end of the Third Age, the men of Gondor were encountering new types of Easterlings that they had never seen before, such as the bearded axemen who appeared at the Pelennor Fields. Despite their regular appearances, what the Easterlings actually looked like isn't that well documented. In the First Age, they are described as being swarthy or sallow. They're short, but broad and strong, with dark hair and dark eyes. Now the First Age Easterlings aren't necessarily the same as the Latter Age Easterlings, but the few times they are described afterwards implies that they were fairly similar. It seems that Tolkien probably envisioned them to look Asiatic in appearance. As for the Haradrim, we know much less about the different groups, which there would have been many, as Harad was never really united. But we know enough about the history of the region to know that there were still big differences between them. For example, during the Second Age, the coastlines of Harad were heavily colonised by the Numenorians, and then they were conquered by the Dúnedain or Black Numenorians. Groups such as the Corsairs of Umbar were the result of this mixed heritage. Further inland, you would get more full-blooded Haradrim, and far to the south, we know of completely different types of men. Some who appear at the Pelennor Fields are given the rather ugly label of troll men of Far Harad. The Haradrim are described in depth in the Lord of the Rings. They are darker skinned, with dark eyes and dark hair that they often braided. They were also described as tall, they loved the colour scarlet, and they often adorned themselves with gold. However, the men of Far Harad, our troll men, are different again described as having black skin, with white eyes and red tongues. It's important to note that these men likely weren't actually troll men. They are just described that way because they are frightening and completely alien to our protagonists. It seems that Tolkien probably envisioned the men of Near Harad to look Middle Eastern and North African in appearance, whereas those from Far Harad looked Sub-Saharan. Now that we have an idea of who they are, let's move to the next question. What were their lands and civilizations like? Were there any similarities? What set them apart from each other? Once again, it might not surprise you to learn that even though they both served Sauron, the Easterlings and the Haradrim had far more differences than similarities. The Easterlings came from Rune, a name that just means East. While we don't know much about the lands beyond the Sea of Rune, we do have an idea about nearer Rune, mostly from how Gondor treated it. Although Gondor did conquer lands up to the Sea of Ruin and considered it part of its territory, these lands were never truly garrisoned and settled. They existed more as a wide buffer zone and Gondor had no problem palming it off to the Northmen. This seems to imply that these lands were wide, flat plains that weren't particularly fertile, unsuitable for an agrarian, settled society such as Gondor. And most of our descriptions of the Easterlings that we know about implies that many of them did not live in agrarian settled societies. They are described as going from east to west in either waves or trickles, which gives us the idea that they were a migratory people 
and they are commonly described by the Gondorians as wild and savage, suggesting that they were not civilized by Gondorian standards. When Romendikil II marched east, he is described as destroying their camps and settlements. Neither word gives the impression of large, bustling metropolises. When the Wayne Riders are encountered, they are given that name because they live entirely out of their wagons. All of this gives us the idea that life in Rune wasn't particularly easy. This was a land that in some cases, even the women, young and elderly were expected to fight. Different groups of Easterlings fought each other over territory and raided their neighbours for loot and spoils. Some tribes would migrate west, but would always run into the wall that was Gondor and its Northmen allies, who they would attempt to raid and conquer with varying degrees of success. It was a land where fortunes could come and go easily. I'll use the Wayne Riders as an example. They rose to prominence and spent over a hundred years as the dominant power in Rune. They were described as well armed, well equipped and well trained than any of the other groups that came before them. But after Gondor defeated them, their power swiftly collapsed and they faded into obscurity. 500 years later, their descendants known as the Balkoth rose to power and while numerous, they are described as poorly equipped and fought as an unorganized horde more than anything else. The Haradrim came from Harad, a name that just means south. Like Rune, we don't know a huge amount about Harad. Much of it is desert and to the south there were great jungles. But there are also vast coastlines and rivers, such as the Harnan, and these coastlines were subject to millennia of Numenorean and later Gondorian investment, the great port city of Umbar being the perfect example. Once again, we get a good idea about Harad from the way Gondor treated it. Whereas Gondor relinquished Rune, they fought tooth and nail over Harad for centuries. Constant exposure to Numenor and its descendants seem to have rendered the Haradrim as far more civilized than their Easterling counterparts. The Haradrim seem to have had walled cities and centralized states. They are described as having kings and living in kingdoms. They were capable of waging long wars against Gondor, and when defeated, they engaged in diplomacy like any other nation state, offering up tribute and hostages to the victorious kings of Gondor. They were capable of building powerful ships, and their works of craft seemed to be up to a fairly decent standard. They also seem to be very wealthy. As I said earlier, the Haradrim are constantly described as having an abundance of gold, so much so that even their foot soldiers and Mumakil are adorned in it. We're not sure if this gold was acquired through mining, or trade, or even conquest, or whether it was actually real gold, but either way, Harad seems to have been quite a wealthy place. After it was conquered by Hyarmendekil I, it was said that children in Gondor played with precious stones and gems as if they were pebbles. This would explain why Gondor was so against relinquishing Harad and the tribute it paid compared to the vast lands in the east. I also want to point out one more difference in the way Gondor perceived Rune and Harad, the lands itself, not the peoples, and that was with the building of roads. In Athelion, Gondor had a road running north-south. To the south, the road actually crossed the river Poros and then the Harnan going deep into Harad, suggesting that it was a useful road that was well used by traders and armies. The northern branch of this road reached the Moranon, the Black Gate, and then continued on for a few miles east before it abruptly stopped. Why? Because the Gondorians realized that building the road was pointless. They didn't want to go to Rune. Ironically, the Wayne Riders would use this road to great effect when they crushed Gondor at the disaster of the Moran. The Easterlings and the Haradrim are both often perceived as Sauron's elite troops, braver and more disciplined than his orcish rabble. But what do we know about the way they fought? Unfortunately, we don't know as much as we would like, but we do know enough to know that the Easterlings and the Haradrim seem to have had some strengths and some weaknesses. But as a reminder, because these groups were not monolithic, they did not all fight the same way. The Easterlings are described as using a wide variety of soldiers. They are described as using axes, spears, swords, and bows like any other people. They sometimes fielded cavalry, including feared horse archers, but sometimes, like the Balkoth, they completely lacked it. Perhaps their most iconic piece of weaponry was their use of chariots. The Wayne Riders used them, and even in the late Third Age, Frodo glimpsed them being used by Easterling chiefs. Although perhaps by this point they were more ceremonial than practical, as none are said to have been used in the War of the Ring. 
The main strength of the Easterlings was in field battles, especially in the open plains. The Easterlings won quite a few major field battles in the Third Age, the Battle of the Plains, the Disaster of the Maramon, and the Battle of Dale. They also came very close to winning several more, such as the Second Battle of Dagolad and the Battle of the Fields of Celebrant. In particular, the Disaster at the Maramon was a showcase of Easterling brilliance, where they used speed, surprise, and shock tactics to shatter the Gondorian army before it could even deploy. They were also very good at raiding, which resulted in the depopulation of lands in Ravanion or in Kalanadon when it was a Gondorian province. But while they were good at winning field battles and raiding, the Easterlings were awful at actually closing out campaigns, and were sometimes rather comically incompetent. The Wayne Riders were particularly guilty of this. After the Battle of the Plains, they didn't take the fight to Gondor because they wrongly assumed it was stronger than it was. Spies are overrated. And after the disaster at the Moranon, instead of assaulting Osgiliath, they partied in Athelion and got themselves ambushed and destroyed. One of my favourite instances of Easterling incompetence was during the Long Winter. They invaded Rohan, but had to bunker down during the harsh winter. In all their infinite wisdom, they camped in a river valley, and when the snows melted, the valley flooded, and the invading force was severely weakened and was forced to retreat. We actually know much less about the Haradrim. We know little about their infantry, except that they wielded swords, spears, and bows, and carried shields with spikes upon them. They seem to have fielded decent cavalry, which were armed with scimitars, but they were still obliterated by Rohan's cavalry. Their greatest weapon in the field were the Mumakil, the giant elephants who were fitted with wooden towers that carried archers upon them. And of course, the Corsairs, who were mostly Haradrim themselves, were excellent sailors and pirates. The Corsairs were undoubtedly the greatest strength of the Haradrim. Their ability to strike up and down Gondor's coast made them a huge thorn in Gondor's side. In battles, the Mumakil were also a major asset. They could trample foes, and friends too if unlucky enough, but their ability to act as walking fortresses was hugely important. At the Pelennor Fields, the horses of the Rohirrim were too afraid to go near the Mumakil, allowing the Haradrim to reform around them and halt the momentum of the Rohirrim. But apart from the Corsairs and the Mumakil, the Haradrim seemed to have been slightly ineffective. Not because they were weak, but because the Gondorians were simply better. While the Haradrim were versatile, they could make amphibious landings, they could besiege and take cities and fight long campaigns, they didn't really have much success in the field. Unlike the Easterlings, the Haradrim never really won a crushing victory against Gondor. They did manage to kill a few kings, but were still decisively defeated in those wars. However, one could make the argument that while the Haradrim never won crushing victories over Gondor, they did slowly bleed them out over time in a way that the Easterlings never did. And finally, what did the Gondorians think of their eternal enemies? After all, most of our information about them comes from Gondorian sources. If you've been paying attention during this video, you probably already have an idea about how the rulers of Gondor perceived the Easterlings and the Haradrim. As I mentioned earlier, the Gondorians viewed the Easterlings as wild men and savages. To give you a better idea, the name Balkov literally means horrible horde in Sindarin. You don't give that name to someone that you like. Outside of war, the Gondorians wanted very little to do with them, and there seems to have been little to no real diplomatic communication between them. And throughout the history of the Third Age, the Easterlings constantly proved why the Gondorians considered them to be savage. They were always the aggressor, and the Gondorians only marched east to deal with them after they had already been attacked. The fact that Romendakil II wasn't even interested in conquering them and instead burned their camps and settlements to ash shows that the Gondorians considered them to be pests rather than potential subjects. That being said, after the War of the Ring, Aragorn, who had actually journeyed in Rune, was gracious and set free his Easterling prisoners. But Gondor's relationship with the Haradrim was far more complex. While the Gondorians considered them to be cruel, they didn't label them as wild and savage. This is because, as Faramir points out, while the two lands were never on friendly terms, they did deal with each other quite regularly, and they shared more similarities than, say, the Gondorians and the Easterlings did. As I said earlier in the video, the Haradrim had recognised kings and kingdoms, who the Gondorians were quite happy to deal with, such as by taking tribute and hostages. 
That being said, while the Easterlings came and went, the Gondorians and the Haradrim fought constantly, with both sides being the aggressors on several occasions. This seemingly eternal war left Harondor, South Gondor, as a deserted no man's land. But after the War of the Ring, it wasn't long before Aragorn received emissaries from Harad, and he managed to quickly make peace with at least some of them. All that being said, Gondor's perception of the Easterlings and the Haradrim wasn't all bad. There is one thing that the Gondorians definitely admired about them. They viewed both of them as brave, bold, and determined. They recognised that in all the battles against Sauron's forces, it was almost always the Easterlings and the Haradrim that were the last force to quit the field, or surrender, or even fight to the death. Annoying? Probably. Respectable? Yes. So let's try and summarise briefly what we know about the Easterlings and the Haradrim. The Easterlings were viewed as a savage people, usually nomadic in nature and relatively poor, just like the land itself. They fought in varied, fast-moving armies that were deadly in the open field, but were less adept at other types of warfare. The Haradrim were viewed as cruel, but were a settled people who could be reasoned with diplomatically. They were wealthy, and while their fleets and Mumakil were powerful weapons, their armies were more easily dealt with by the Gondorians. But both people were brave warriors and were willing to fight to the end, at least earning them some respect from the enemies that they were so dedicated to destroying. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting, and I really mean it this time because the script took me over 4 hours to write, which might be a record outside of my podcast video. That being said, it was definitely an enjoyable 4 hours. If you want more comparison videos, please let me know in the comments, I do read them. Cheers, farewell, and remember, from the perspective of the Easterlings and the Haradrim, it's actually the Westerlings and the Northrons who are the bad guys.